You've entered Bookstorm with Kristen Civiletto and me, Chris Storm. This is a podcast devoted to best-selling books that matter, books that make a difference. We're diving down deep with beloved authors about their stories. We're exposing hot-button topics and heartfelt themes, the issues that affect each of us in our own lives as siblings, parents, partners, friends, as human beings. We're braving new ideas, fresh thoughts, hard lessons and important truths. Those kinds of things that stay with us long after we turn the last page and close the book. Welcome back, Bookstorm followers and loyal listeners. We are so excited that yesterday we found out that we are now being listened to in 30 countries, 333 cities, and almost 50 states, including Hawaii. And we have a very special treat for you here today because Kristen and I were able to receive the advanced reader's copy of a book that we adore. It's called Hester by the wonderful author Lori Lico Albanese, and she's here with us today. The book comes out on October 4th. That's when you'll be seeing this podcast, and you're going to want to rush out and buy this book. It is a book that matters. It's a life changer. Let me tell you a little bit about Lori. She is the author of three novels and a memoir that have been translated into four languages. She's been in the book publishing and journalism industry for many years. Her stories appeared in the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, and elsewhere. She's taught creative and formal writing to all ages, from elementary school to adults. And she currently runs a workshop for aspiring and journeying writers. Her books have been chosen by the IndieBound list, independent booksellers. They've been acclaimed and endorsed by the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, RT Magazine, Shelf Awareness, the New York Journal of Books, and more. Wow, Lori. Very impressive. Congratulations and well earned. She grew up on Long Island, graduated from New York University with a degree in journalism, an MFA in creative writing from Stone Coast at Southern Maine. She lives in Montclair, New Jersey, where she's raised two grown children and enjoys spending lots of time time with book people and writers. And there's something we have in common, Lori, and we're (laughs) so happy you're here with us today. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you, Chris and Kristen. It's great to be here. Great to see everyone. Yeah. I know. We are so excited. Well, without giving away any spoilers, I like to give a little bit of a summary of your story, and I would love for you to add anything that you want or correct anything if you think we should. Uh, First of all, Hester offers a fictional account of the woman who could have inspired the classic The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Nathaniel Hawthorne. Mm -hmm. The story follows Isabel Gamble. She's a skilled seamstress in Scotland who carries some generational secrets, including a gift of synesthesia. In her Mm -hmm. case, it expresses itself as the ability to hear or see colors when she views something or takes it in through her senses. Her husband is an apothecary. And his addiction to opium sends them basically to the poorhouse. Her father helps them, and she decides, and as a couple, they decide to emigrate to America. They set (laughs) sail for Salem, Massachusetts, where they land. And she, in Scotland, was unable to express herself creatively. But now in the new world, she finds that she must put some of her gifts to use, and that's what she ends Mm -hmm. up doing. She has a chance encounter with the writer, Nathaniel Hawthorne. And she recognizes maybe in him a kindred spirit. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's some kind of a spark there. And Mm -hmm. perhaps even um, a spirit of helping people who are being oppressed in some way. Mm -hmm. Now, Nathaniel Hawthorne has his own concerns. He's a man who is haunted by the way that his ancestors treated women during the infamous witch trials in 1692. But eventually, her independent-mindedness and her use of her gifts leads her to a very difficult position with the townspeople. Uh, She is suspected of a number of things, including, of course, adultery, as Mm -hmm. we see um, in the Scarlet Letter that perhaps is connected. In this story, we see a very strong woman who is standing up to the issues of the day, including some of the most pressing in history, 
slavery, racism, and the oppression of women. Mm -hmm. Would you like to add anything, Lori? Is there anything specific? Wow, no, that was great, Kristen. Can you just send me that synopsis so I can use it? (laughs) Absolutely. I guess, um, you know, I guess it, when I'm doing a really short summary, when I'm just introducing, I always just say that the novel began with a literary question. And the question is, was there a real Hester Prynne? And who was she? And what if she could have her say? What if she could tell us her own story? Mm-hmm. I love but, it. It evokes yeah. so many, given the historical time, there's just so much to explore there, which is exactly yeah. what your story did. So, Thank you. Yeah. Well, if if we're ready to brave the storm, Lori, Chris, you want to kick us off? We are. I want to say first to Lori for our readers, I want to say thank you for writing this book. It's about heroic women in history who defied powerful men and a vengeful society. It's not just a story for yesterday, it's a story for today. And yeah. all readers are going to treasure it. I love this quote from the beloved heroine Isabel. But I understand now that there is want everywhere. I met women who were afraid to walk in the street for fear someone would mock their dress or their twisted arm or their purple scar or birthmark. But the character Mercy taught Isabel, sometimes it's best to be invisible. Rather than suffer with cruelty and prejudice, Mercy said, you learn how to move through places so folks don't see you. Then you can do things folks don't want you to do. Mm -hmm. We loved how the character Isabel found her voice through her gift of embroidery. And we loved how she maintained her voice in some way. What hidden strength did you instill in her as the writer that maybe each of us can learn from today when battling these prejudices that we still endure? Yeah. Wow, I love that question because it's so encompassing and thank you for picking that, those particular quotes out. So I think, you know, for Isabel particularly, uh, but for all the women in the book and for most of the time, most of the women that I've written even in my other novels, the idea is everyone has, women especially, we have desires and goals, and then we have obstacles, right? So what we need to do is learn how to um, tap into our own strength and our own power. And even I would say our own uh, divine female energy, if you will, Uh, and then figure out sometimes that's about stepping forward and being, you know, very upfront, but that doesn't always work. Uh, Excuse me, but a full frontal attack, you know, that's kind of male, right? But for women and for everyone, I think when you learn how to um, access your power and learn to do what the situation calls for, whether that's being more withholding, being more quiet in your quest, right? maybe step of your ops through them and you know for Isabel the obstacles have been I don't know the idea that women especially in her period were in 1829 Scotland and then Salem uh, that women shouldn't be self-determined right that you shouldn't be able to just decide you're going to have a career as a as a seamstress or a, or a pattern maker those things were actually very much in the male world. Once you could make money off of cloth and sewing, uh, the men took it over. And so that was, an, there were obstacles to her um, independence and she had to find ways to work around them. And as I said, sometimes straight through and sometimes going around. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I, I love this also, this quote from Mercy. It comes from knowing the difference between who you are and who they think you are. So I guess what, what Isabel really did was she said, I know who you think I am. And people deal with this today. And you're right, not only men, but also women. I don't care who you think I am. I'm going to pursue and have the courage to be who I know I am supposed to be. And sometimes even doing that quietly yeah. Maybe it's better for you. You know, as long as you're doing it, you don't have to yeah. advertise it. Yeah. yeah. There's a quote that I've always kept on a little note card since I had my very first job. And it's a quote from Thoreau. And um, excusing the fact that it's all ma- male pronouns, it says, if one advances confidently in the direction of one's dreams, 
and endeavors to live the life he has imagined, he will meet with success unexpected in common hours, which to me is just like, do your work, you know, know what your strengths are. And we all have weaknesses and we can all focus too much on our weaknesses. But if you just focus on your strengths, it's what we tell our kids, right? You know, focus on your strengths, put your head down, do your work, don't let anything deter you. There's another quote I have in my office. It's a, from Goethe and it's do not hurry, do not rest. And that is sort of a, I think a good life philosophy for, especially for people who are ambitious and especially for women who are ambitious, you know, men are always, people in general are, are have a love-hate relationship with ambition, um, you know, in their own ambition, but especially when they see uh, women being ambitious, there's always this, you know, oh, you're very ambitious, aren't you? And that question is sort of a double-edged sword. And so you have to, for, I mean, for Isabel, I, what she's doing is a very private thing. Her embroidery, she starts out doing it for herself as a response to her synesthesia, which I know we're gonna talk about. Um, and then when she's deterred, when it gets her in trouble, whatever it does, just like Hester Prynne in the Scarlet Letter, Hester Prynne, has to embroider an A on her dress. And instead of making it the shameful thing, she makes it beautiful. And she wears it as a badge of courage and honor instead of a badge of shame. And that's, it's actually the strength I gave to my protagonist, Isabel, is the strength I took from the Scarlet Letter. You know, I didn't come up with it, just the idea of withstanding uh, social pressures um, came from, came from the original novel. Mm -hmm. I love that original novel, by the way. That's one of my favorite yeah. of all the classics, too. Yeah. I loved that you drew from that and from Nathaniel Hawthorne, which we're going to get yeah. into a little bit more, too. Yeah. 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 In fact, you yeah. said something so interesting about embracing our gifts. And often those are things that people also criticize. You're too ambitious. Well, when you embrace aspects of that, look at how strong that can make you. I, what a great yeah. way to look at that, of the criticism and embracing. Uh, the other thing that you just said, Kristen, reminds me that one of my very early sort of on my inspiration board, one of my very early ideas for um, for Isabel was her gift is also her her gift is also her curse, and her curse is also her gift. And I think, you know, we can see a million ways in our own personal lives and in other people's lives that 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 happens and. How do you work with that? Especially creative people feel that way. You know, it can be a burden. Imagine somebody who's psychic, for example. What a burden and what a gift and how do you get in front of it so that it's not ruling you, but it's you're making it a tool in your life. Absolutely. Very well yeah. said. Yes, I think yeah. this, I do think this all the time. To do something out of the ordinary, there's probably something that's extraordinary in you. But sometimes society doesn't want you to be extraordinary. It wants you to be just like everybody else, starting yes. in elementary school. Don't yes. look different, sure. don't talk different. Yeah. But those differences are the very things that leads, lead us to make discoveries. Right. And in new the, right. art forms. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, that's the problem with everybody conforming, right? If everyone's coloring in the lines, who's gonna come up with the idea that isn't already visible to everybody else? So yeah, yeah. Love it. Love that theme in the novel. Yeah. Lori, let's kind of press into another theme that was very evident to me. And Chris and I have spent a lot of time discussing this one, and that is immigration. Yeah. Um, Isabel was kind of looked down upon by the residents of Salem, and they were the longer term residents, I should say, because right. she had newly immigrated to Massachusetts and to America, in particular right. because she came from Scotland, right? Um, right. And, and therefore, she wasn't one of those old families. And mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting because Nathaniel's family regarded themselves as one of the original inhabitants and had a kind of a superiority complex about that. But one of the things that Isabel wonders is, weren't we all immigrants at some point? Unless you descended from a family, an indigenous family, you and your family probably immigrated from somewhere. Right. And I was, and I was wondering how you think that issue, because you were dealing with it in so many complex ways, resonates today. And obviously today we have other aspects that come into play, but I was wondering if you were trying to draw some parallels there. You know, um, 
thank you. I really like that question and I'm glad that you picked up on that. Um, one of the reasons, so first of all, remember in the Scarlet Letter, Hester Prynne is, is an immigrant, right? She's come from England. And so I naturally had Isabel coming from afar. So, you know, she's a stranger in a new place. And then she's an outsider and she's viewed as an outsider because she, her family's new in town. And that, that, you know, that resonates today, whether we're talking about immigrants or somebody who moves from Western Virginia to Northeastern Virginia, you know, I mean, it still resonates. Um, but I think the real, you know, the real thing I was thinking about when I, when I engaged in some of the error to an embracing of outsiders, although of course I, I do think that we should embrace immigrants because we're a nation of immigrants, as I said. Um, but also that it's always been the way at newcomers askance. We've always thought we're doing here. And so that was sort of what I was thinking about when I was touching on those. I was certainly thinking about today's society. And I, I think it's just as important to remember it's never been any different. You know, we weren't welcoming to immigrants in the 1920s. You know, my family came here in the early, in the late 1800s. Italians weren't embraced. You know, my, my heritage is Italian, largely Italian. I Italians weren't embraced. Like their newcomers have always been looked at askance, and they've always sort of had to been in, to prove themselves. Um, but the other thing in the novel is that most of the main characters are outsiders, right? Nathaniel Hawthorne sees himself as an outsider, even though he's from an original quote, in quotes, um, Salem family. He sees himself as an outsider because, first of all, he's a writer and writers like to see themselves as outsiders, but also um, because he's the family wealth that his historically his family had from being an original settler, right, um, original European settler, they've lost. And so he's a he's a fatherless boy, and she's a fatherless girl, and they meet in this area of vulnerability. So there's a lot of layering of the idea of an of outsiders. Yeah. Good. So so back to what we were saying, I I thought that was really interesting what you said because it highlights how fear underlies a lot of the us versus them and this otherness and, yes. it, and really at the root of that is fear right it's fear of the unknown fear that yes. these people will take what you have right but but those are themes that i thought were so fantastic in terms of how they really should apply to us today and yeah. as we think through the big issues of our day yes yeah i think i think that's right you know they say that there's only two stories, a man goes on a journey and a stranger comes to town. But I like to think that that's actually the same story depending on which perspective you take. You know, so we're all strangers somewhere. And I, I, I think it's actually kind of uh, sort of pre-cerebral that we are naturally a pack animal. And so you're looking for your pack and somebody from another pack, you might be like, oh, what are you doing here? Like you said, you've come for our food and our water. What do you want? And then, you know, why can't we all get along? There's certainly enough riches in this country for everybody to be welcoming. That's what I think. Yeah, especially when you look yeah. at the pack from a bigger standpoint, and that is the human race. Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So true. I love that. Um, I wanted to get in a little bit more to the character Nathaniel Hawthorne, who yeah. Isabel refers to as Nat, and his voice was found within his written stories. So I'm going to take a quote from him from the book. He said, I write secrets inside of secrets. That's what I write. Men who judge others harshly while hiding their own terrible deeds. Mm -hmm. And he was speaking about his own ancestors here, I believed, who yeah. had convicted and killed these uh, supposed Salem witches, which was very intriguing part of the story, he was fighting to relieve himself of a family curse. But as the reader, I couldn't help but wonder, um, Nat held his own guilty deeds. What was the curse that caused Nat to fail? Was, was it his own personal guilt? Mm -hmm. Or was it actually the curse? And do we yeah. do that to our own selves sometimes? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, Nat, Nathaniel Hawthorne is a really interesting character, you know, because he was very dark 
And one of the things I, you know, as a person, he had a dark outlook. And one of the things when I was researching, I talked to historians in Salem and one was so helpful by saying to me, don't make Nathaniel Hawthorne too nice because he wasn't really that nice. Um, so, and, and then when you read the biographies, you know, one of his quotes is um, in every man's soul, there's a coffin and a grave. So, you know, and if you look like you're right, uh, Chris, that I did draw on a lot of his work to create him as a character, not just his work um, in The Scarlet Letter, but his short stories. They're pretty gothic. So gothic meaning there are, you know, um, mysterious sort of supernatural elements that can come in and, uh, you know, change people or somebody can be dancing with the devil or you know the, he, he has the minister's black veil where one day the, t the beloved town minister puts a veil on never again lifts it even to his wife and he never says why so Hawthorne was I think it came both from his family history um, and the fact this is great great grandfather was a magistrate in the Salem witch trials but then there were you know listen he's he's living in a Puritan society. It's, it's not the 1600s, but they're still, they're in a society like that. There's, it's pre-transcendentalism. There's a lot of personal guilt. You know, you're always being told, talk, told and talked to about your sins. And I think um, he kind of embraced that and he uses it in his storytelling. So, um, well, I don't know, you know, in the end, Nat doesn't really fail, right? Because he publishes this book and then he goes on to have a great career. Um, but I think it's, again, that idea of the con concept of the self. If you think you're cursed, you're going to be cursed, right? Uh, and if you decide that that, and the curse, by the way, was very specific. It was uh, John Hathorne, his uh, ancestor, was the magistrate on the witch trials. And when one of the women, I don't remember which one, was being hanged, she shouted from the gallows, you know, may your ancestors, may your descendants have blood in their throats. And, you know, Hawthorne's family did lose monetary standing. And so he just always looked at that as a stain upon his soul. But I also think at a certain point, who knows how young he embraced it because it was a good it's a good story to be sort of a dark troubled writer and i think it was a little bit of a depressive too um so you can be your own worst enemy right your strength can be your gift your gift can be your curse yes. so i and his character was very interesting and i have a whole different outlook on him now and i can't uh. give away any spoilers but i liked him a real lot for a good while <laughs> yeah and i didn't anymore right yeah, he was supposed to be the bad boy that all the that we all have in our past, you know, the the girls are drawn to the bad boy until you realize, oh, that bad boy is trouble. Um, and uh, I thought, though, in the end, I kind of always knew I didn't always know that he would do what he does. But once I settled on it, it made absolute sense because he's an outsider. But when push comes to shove, he's like, I have a name and my name is, is historic. My, my, um, this city is part of who I am. I'm not leaving here. I'm not giving up my name. I'm not doing any of that for anyone. You know, I have a goal in life too, and it's to be a writer. And, you know, I had my agent in my ear, excuse me, I had my agent in my ear a little bit while I was working on it saying, you know how writers are, you know, they're really always focused on their goal. And like, yes, true. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought about it a little bit, the ending, you know, I can't, we can't say, but I can't say this. Was it a good ending for him or would it have been better if he took the other course and sometimes did he get in his own mind, I'm cursed, and purposefully ruin his ending in another way? The whole thing was so intertwined, you could look at it in so many different ways. It really made the reader think about this for a good while. Yeah, yeah. And of course, I mean, I'm dealing with somebody who there is a historical record about. And so I had to have an ending that um, completely fit with what's in the historical record. I It has to be plausible. And it is true, and this is in the book, that when his wife, Sophia, read his book, this is what they've said in the history, 
that she burst into tears and ran upstairs and went to bed for with a three day migraine after she read the manuscript for the Scarlet Letter. So I was able to have some fun with conjecture, like, hmm, why would she do that, right? Because um, it does go on to have what was considered to be a happy marriage mm -hmm. and three that was, children. Yeah. It's very intriguing. I, we love historical fiction when you pull truths out of history, then weave yeah. a tale based around those things we didn't know. And you yes. did a wonderful, wonderful you story. Exactly right, Chris. You have to find the space where things aren't known. So, you know, those two Agatha Christie books that came out last year, The, the Mystery of Mrs. Oh, Christie. Yeah. Um, you know, 11 missing days in a very well-documented life. Look what you can do with those 11 days. Anything you want, mm -hmm. because nothing was ever said. Absolutely. Yeah, yes. yeah we, had a, we had a wonderful discussion with the author about the Christie affair, and that was fantastic. Oh, yeah, we had her yeah. on here. It was yeah, great. It was wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> um, and by yeah. the way, I was thinking about a country song. You want a good, a bad boy, but a good man. Uh -huh. As you were talking, Laura, it's all I was thinking in my head. You want um, a bad boy, but a good man. Oh, I yeah. like that. Uh -huh. really yeah. Now, I know Chris is going to ask you. Oh, yeah. I know Chris is going to ask you about uh, synesthesia before we end, but I wanted to ask you about one other very interesting topic that you broached in your story, and that is this glimpse into the very beginnings of the Underground Railroad. Yeah. And I loved, you showed us how people responded very different ways to slavery, but everybody yeah. knew a reckoning was on the horizon. Wherever they stood on the issue, we knew something significant was coming. And I right. thought you dealt with that very sensitively. But one of the things you did was you highlighted some stories about black families that were successful. Now, I didn't yeah. even know there was anything along the lines until I read it in your story right. at that time. And I right. was wondering if you thought that some of these families in history helped pave the way for our changing perceptions and, you know, brought about this reckoning even sooner. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Obviously, I I have I didn't work that into the story without a lot of care, um, and so John Remond is a is from history. He's not an invented person. John Remond and his wife um, ran Hamilton House Catering Hall, and he was he had come from the islands, Barbados, I think I don't remember maybe Jamaica. Anyway, he'd come for, he came from the islands, and he was never enslaved. And he and his wife, you know, were very successful. They were prosperous and they had a bunch of children and two of their children became uh, leading abolitionists. And um, so 100%, I mean, one of the things I discovered in the book, I discovered a lot about the roots of slavery in New England, which go very deep, right? And the thing is the narrative, people in New England were able to change the narrative sometime before the Civil War to make it seem as if slavery was only in the South. And of course it was brutal because it was on plantations in the South, but slavery was everywhere. So you have that. Um, but, and one of the other things I learned that I didn't thoroughly realize is that the early Underground Railroad was really run by African-Americans. And of course it was, right? But especially if it's women, Black women helping slaves escape, they would have had to keep that story very quiet. So there's not a lot of places in the history for it to have been retold. And the other thing, as three white women here, there are a lot of things that we, myself, I'll just speak for myself, I've only learned in the last five years. You know, that if you talk to a person of color, especially somebody who has roots in slavery, a Black person whose family was enslaved, they'll say like, you're just learning that now? I'm like, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I should say, uh, you know, should I say, I'm sorry, I, I can only learn it when I can learn it. And so it was important for me, I just wanna say one last thing on that topic. If you read a Hawthorne book, you would think there was never a black person in America. And that was important for me. I put that character Mercy in because she kind of just showed up on the page. And once she showed up on the page, I said, okay, um, you know, what might her story really be? And I don't think her story is so exceptional. I think it's just that it's being told is um, as something that we're re realizing as new. Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why fiction is so important, right? We're yeah. able to see ourselves. We're able to learn and immerse ourselves in a time that also resonates today. And that was one of the things I think that we both loved about your story, because again, it, you're reading about this time period, but every single issue is something that we're currently thinking about and wrestling with. 
in so many <laughs> ways. So I thought that was fantastic. Um, I think Still you today. To I just want to add, we are located in New York State on the border of Canada. And oh. I have been in homes where the Underground Railroad had taken place. We have a lot of historic homes here that that's passed through. So reading that in your story really hit home for us. Yeah. And I enjoyed it. We're in upstate New York, like outside of western New York, Buffalo. Buffalo, Niagara. Oh, okay. I'm just, I'm going on up to Hobart, New York this weekend oh, for the yeah. Hobart Festival of Women Writers. Oh, how Beautiful. wonderful. Yeah, yeah what, part of uh, William Ho Hobart Smith College, right? Must be part um, of Hobart actually the town of Hobart is yeah, the college. So. Yeah. Wow, that's wonderful. Doesn't that sound yeah. exciting? Okay, now yeah. I just want to bring up one last thing. This term that synesthesia, am I saying right? Synesthesia. 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 synesthesia yeah. We found so intriguing. So yeah. for the listeners, um, do you want to describe what it is for them? Yeah. Yeah, um, I start out with an author's note in the beginning explaining that synesthesia is the cross experience of your senses. So you might see something and then have a taste associated with it, or you might hear something and see a color. So for Isabel, she has two forms of synesthesia. It's, it's like very basic brain mechanics. You have a crossing of senses. So for Isabel, she sees letters in color, which is one kind of synesthesia, and she hears sounds in color, which is another kind of synesthesia. And, um, you know, the reason I gave her synesthesia is really very organic to the Scarlet Letter. I was pretty well into the book. When I started, you know, I, I said to myself, wait a minute, why was everyone going to Hester Prynne, who was a banished, scorned woman, to have her do embroidery when every single woman in America knew how to use a needle. So I said, she must have been really extraordinary for them to, you know, basically cross the picket line or whatever to go have to employ her. Um, and I said to myself, well, maybe she had synesthesia. Maybe she had like really imaginary vision, really, uh, you know, imaginary visions, immense visions of color. And then I said, well, maybe she has synesthesia. And then I said, well, yeah, she does. And it worked. I didn't know if it would work, but I gave it to her and I interviewed some people. And the thing that about the synesthesia is that the, in this time in the story, 1829, there was really very little research yet being done and certainly nothing that would have reached the backwaters of Salem. Um, and so imagine having this experience and not knowing what it is or why and just knowing that you're very different from everybody else something else that she has to contend with you know do i embrace it is it a gift or a curse do i use it or do i let it scare me well at the so, risk of, of giving you making a bad pun it gave your book and your story a depth of color yeah. that was just lyrical and beautiful in yeah. fact if you don't mind i'm going to read one sentence or maybe two sentences Please. go ahead their voices rise up in vibrant wisp of yellow and gold. The wind was sometimes fierce pink, and the sound of the waterfall on rocks glinted silver. These were some of the observations that Isabel made, and I just thought they were so beautiful because your entire book resonated like that in that level of depth. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it was really fun because I do, especially as a person who works with words, words are very black and white. And so it was fun for me to put a lot of color in the book and then write about it. And yeah. back in those days, and she was keeping it a secret because there was such a fear of witchcraft and right. that she would be evil because of it. And yeah. I am grateful that we have evolved, <clears throat> I believe, to a great extent as a people who do treasure certain gifts now today. Like yeah. someone who looks at a scenery and thinks musical notes, hears yeah. musical notes. This can transpose into all sorts of different senses but i so very much enjoyed this part of the book so very much billy eilish and lady gaga both um are reported to have self-report to have synesthesia wow. so yeah I so i was able to you know i was able to sort of oh and i interviewed people like it's like i don't remember the statistical number but it's not as rare as you might think 
I, my first encounter with synesthesia was I was tutoring a girl, a, a high school girl here, and she explained to me that seven is a female number, but four, I think, was a boy. And I was like, what are you talking about? And then she explained the phenomenon to me. And that was my first real introduction to it. Wow, that's very intriguing. That's something yeah. you're going to want to look into a little bit more. I love that yeah. about the story. Well, Lori, we just thank you so much for joining us here today on Bookstorm. For our listeners, October 4th, Hester by Lori Lico Albanese. And you can connect with her. You're going to want to. You can find her at LoriLicoAlbanese.com on Facebook. You can sign up for her newsletter. You can find her on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you for joining us today, Lori. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank, Thank you. you, Kristen. It was great. Thank you so much for being so enthusiastic about my book. <laughs> we really loved it. And keep writing. We can't see, wait to see what you're going to do next. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. So, uh, yes, yeah, so great, this book. We had so many deep issues. We could have talked to her for hours. But this issue of the synesthesia, and I don't know why I can't pronounce it correctly, but it really hit me strong. I wonder if we all don't have a little bit of this in some way. Do we not, maybe not recognize if we hear a song we love that we may associate it with a color? Or if we see, hear a, hear a, uh, if we see a vibrant picture that we don't think of a texture that goes along with it? As writers, when you describe something in nature, we often use smooth, soft, vibrant. We do transpose these ideas a little. I think every one of us to a little extent. Yeah, I think that's fascinating because she was talking about how it expressed itself in this particular character, but there are multiple ways that your senses can bring in other senses and transpose it. You know, for me, I don't think this is a gift, but I often see the whole of something. So if I'm reading a story or I'm writing something, writing a brief, whatever it is, I see laid before me the entire thing, and then I start diving in. But until I imag imagine the entire thing, I, it's very difficult for me to dive into it. And I don't see know if whole. that makes sense. But. Yes, it does, yes. It's just, a, it's just a combination of one or more senses that mm -hmm. trigger each other. Mm -hmm. And I just can't help but think maybe this is how it's supposed to be because our senses are the most important thing in our lives. It's the thing that helps us to experience life at the fullest. And I just want to explore this more, if they, how they intertwine. I love the beauty of that story. Yeah. Do you, do you Have you ever run across anybody who has different sensory perceptions that are unusual? Uh, I, I don't think that I ever have, but I'm not a teacher. I would think a teacher might more be more apt to explore that with yeah. a student. But I love that she said that a young child said that. Yeah. Well, what's interesting also is the fact that many people may be reluctant to bring up a gift along those lines because it does make them a little different in their minds. But today you know. we embrace that, I hope. This is what I hope. I read these historic novels and so, sometimes I just cringe at the narrow-mindedness and the prejudice. And I know we're still battling a lot of it today, but it's just my hope that we overcome it. You brought up the whole topic of immigration um, and you brought up a good point that we are all immigrants to some extent. Unless, I, I, we're, unless we are indigenous peoples or descended from indige, indigenous peoples, absolutely. Yeah. And, and Lori brought up something great I want to touch on because I've often thought of this. We are a culture that likes to gravitate, gravitate to packs, and we love to say that we're part of a group, and I've often wondered why this is. So we like to say we're New Yorkers. We like to say we're Buffalo Bills fans. We maybe like to say I'm an alma mater of, of this college. Um, or we say uh, we prefer to vacation in this area, but we love to put ourselves in a category with others. And why is that, do you think? Is there a strength in that? Maybe a feeling of uplifting uh, feeling in that? But we do tend to do this. We're Northerners. We're Southerners. We're Americans. We're whatever our ancestors were. We're English. We're Irish. We're German. We're women. We're women. Well, I think that part of that is a longing for identity because when you have a firmer understanding of your identity, whatever that identity is, then other things fall into place. You view the world through that perspective. You know what might be expected of you in terms of behavior or social mores. And I think it gives people some comfort because there's guidelines. 
you're able to see, okay, this is a pathway forward if this is my identity. The issue now is, of course, we have multiple identities and some of them are conflicting identities. And that's a very interesting issue that it I think we're going to so end up exploring in the future. I, I thought about that many times, how we do tend to gravitate to these little mini packs. You even mm -hmm. find them in high schools. I go to this high school, you don't. And, and it provides a good competition for sports and things of that yeah. nature. But it can also be bad in a way. I think sometimes we're looking for pride in those things and maybe for power. And I think that's a really good thing until it becomes exclusive. This is my group, don't come any further. This is, yeah. our group is better than yours. Yours can never be as good as us. I think that's the line that we don't want to cross. Yeah, well, and think about it too. Our first identity should be, we're members of the human race. We're inhabitants of this planet Earth together with even other creatures. And I think maybe the bigger the identity group to which you subscribe, uh, maybe the different way you think about the Earth and your responsibility towards your fellow members of your identity pack, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. if I think about other people across the world as part of the human race, they're part of my tribe. Mm -hmm. And that makes you feel differently about other people. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting concept though. Thank you, Lori Lico Albanese for this incredibly deep and meaningful novel. We just loved it. I uh, want to give a little shout out as always to our incredibly talented producer and sound engineer extraordinaire, the Mr. Mark Carey. Hope you guys enjoyed today's show. <clears throat> we'll see you next week. We sure will. Thank you, Mark. Um, please keep in touch with Bookstorm. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can visit our webpage. You can see us on YouTube. We also now have a presence on TikTok, which is Book Talk. Look out. We're there. We're really shaking things up. Uh, if you want to follow along, here's who we have coming up on our fall lineup. You're going to love it. Ellen Marie Wiseman, The Lost Girls of Willowbrook. Brendan Slocum, The Violin Conspiracy. Viola Shipman, The Edge of Summer. Lisa Unger, Secluded Cabin Sleep Six. Meg Waite Clayton, The Postmistress of Paris. John Searles, Her Last Affair. William Kent Kruger, Fox Creek, and Shelby Van Pelt, Remarkably Bright Creatures. Until next time, one of the best ways to brave the storm is to dive down deep into life-changing fiction.